Welcome online listeners and viewers, and thank you for joining this Science AAAS webinar, Beyond Blotting, Boosting Protein Analysis with Cell-Based Immunofluorescent Assays. My name is Jackie Oberst, and I'm the Associate Editor for Custom Publishing here at Science. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Joining us today as guest speakers are Dr. Virginia Aracalvala um, Gomeza from Biocruces Biscaya Health Research Institute in Bilbao, Spain, and Dr. Joseph Salvino from the Wistar um, Institute in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Dr. Jessica Zinsky from the LICOR Biosciences in Scranton, Pennsylvania, whom we will learn more about shortly. Before we get started, I'd like to orient our online viewers to what's currently being seen. At the top right of your screen, you'll find a photo of today's speakers and a view bio link, which you can click on to read more details about the uh, about their research and background. To the right, you'll also see the resources tab where you can find additional information about technologies related to today's discussion and a PDF of the slides. After the speaker presentations, we will, we will have a, a, we will intersperse uh, well, questions uh, from the viewers. Um, so start thinking about some questions now and submit them at any time by asking the ask a question tab also on the right, typing the question into the message box and then clicking submit. You can log on to your Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn accounts during the webinar to post updates or send tweets about the event. Just click the relevant icon at the bottom left of the screen. For tweets, you can add the hashtag hash science webinar. Finally, thank you to LICOR Biosciences for sponsoring today's webinar. And now, let's begin. Western blotting has been a flagship assay for protein analysis for more than 40 years. However, this time-consuming assay is low throughput and fraught with potential pitfalls, such as incomplete transfer, nonspecific antibodies, and high background. As a response to these challenges, a new direction in Western blotting has emerged cell-based quantitative immunofluorescence assays performed in multi-well plates. This approach combines the specificity of Western blotting with the reproducibility and throughput of an ELISA. Cell-based immunofluorescent assays, such as LICOR Biosciences in-cell Western assay, detect proteins in adherent suspension and primary cells that are live or fixed. Pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies are using these assays to screen high numbers of samples undergoing various experimental treatments and conditions. These assays are also contributing to the development of antiviral medications, as well as to a basic mechanistic understanding of the action of viruses. Without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce our panelists to you now. Dr. Aracalvela Gomeza is an Ikerbask Iker research professor, head of the Nucleic Acids Therapeutics in Rare Disorders Group at BioBiscaya HRI, and chair of Cost Action Delivery of Antisense RNA Therapeutics known as Darter. She is a trained pharmacist and completed a master's in science in immunopharmacology and a PhD in the biomolecular, in the molecular basis of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. As a postdoctoral researcher, she participated in the first two clinical trials for Iteplerson and the preclinical development of this and other antisense oligonucleotides currently approved for the treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. She was appointed as an Ikerbask research professor in 2019, and her main interest is the development of better methods to evaluate candidate treatments for neuromuscular disorders, such as nucleic acid therapeutics. Her group was renamed in 2023 as Nucleic Acids Therapeutics and Rare Disorders to reflect the widening research interest of the group. Through the international network Darter, she aims to improve the delivery of oligonucleotide drugs to target tissues. So hi, Virginia. <laughs> Um, Dr. Salvino received his PhD at Brown University in organic chemistry and was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Pennsylvania, working under the mentorship of Casey Nicolau and Ralph S. Hirschman in synthetic organic chemistry and medicinal chemistry. He has over 30 years of industrial pharmaceutical research and academic experience in drug discovery. He has served in senior level roles in both large pharmaceutical companies such as Sterling Winthrop, Roan um, pool and Rohrer and Cephalon, and small pharmaceutical companies such as Aldelor and Ribex Pharmaceuticals, with the goal of advancing programs from target validation through lead optimization and preclinical development. Dr. Salvino 
joined academia in 2011 as a professor at Drexel University College of Medicine and moved to the Y-Star Institute, a biomedical research institute founded in 1894 as the first and now oldest research institute in the U.S. in 2017 to become their first medicinal chemist and to establish synthetic and medicinal chemistry capabilities for academic drug discovery efforts. He is a medicinal chemistry professor and the scientific director of the Molecular Screening Shared Resource at the Weister Institute. His primary research interests focus on applying medicinal chemistry, synthetic chemistry, and drug discovery expertise to interesting academic programs to add value and facilitate translation into the clinic. Dr. Zinsky, our third speaker, um, who is our third speaker, is a senior solutions and support scientist at Lycor Biotechnologies, serving the mid-Atlantic region of the United States. She received her PhD in biochemistry from the University of the Sciences and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Rowan University. Combining her research and teaching experience, she trains users on best practices for protein-based assays and offers expert advice on troubleshooting and enhancing customers' research activities. She has been with Lycor for over five years and specializes in Western blots and the in-cell Western assay. She helps develop customer resources such as training sessions, seminars, and the training videos on Lambda U, Lycor's educational portal for Western blots. Each of our panelists have prepared a short presentation to give us all an overview into in-cell Western assays. We will start first with Dr. Zinsky. Dr. Zinsky? Thank you, Jackie. Oops, I didn't say that. Um, so unfortunately, I'm seeing that my signal might be suboptimal. So if any point during this, it is better to turn my camera off if you would, wouldn't mind just doing that for me. Um, I'm going to turn it on. Um, are we good? Perfect. Um, Jackie, are we good? Jackie, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Yes, okay, okay, sorry. I can hear you. I don't see the uh, shared screen yet uh, of your slides, but let me know and I'm happy to pop up your slides. You'll just have to tell me when to advance your slides. Um, or there's been a little bit of lag. Okay, I see your slides now. Wonderful. And then let me just ensure that my camera is turned on. Sorry about the delay. Um, there we go. Um, so are we good? So you can see my screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Uh, sorry about that delay. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm really happy that you're able to join us today, in which we'll be talking about how to go beyond blotting to ensure that you can boost your protein analysis with cell-based immunofluorescent assays. As a solutions and support scientist, I regularly interact with my customers discussing their assays, their applications, and how they can develop that. And it's really been through these conversations that I've learned just how impactful this assay can be. The InSell Western assay is a higher throughput quantitative immunofluorescent assay. It is performed on cells in micro well plates. Now, while it's optimized for 96 and 384 well plates, it really is applicable to all formats. The assay begins by growing your cells in the plate and then treating them. That may be through a drug screen, a reagent change, or even a time course. After treatment, you fix the cells, suspend them in animation. Then you permeabilize the cells to poke holes into the membrane, allowing the reagents to come into and exit out of them. If you're interested though, in a target on the extracellular matrix, such as a receptor, you can skip this step. That's referred to as the on-cell Western assay. But regardless of which version you're doing, the next step is blocking the cells, probing them with the primary antibody and washing that away, probing with the secondary antibody, washing that away, imaging it, and then quantifying it. This assay is becoming more popular as I have these conversations with customers and they read the publications on them, but still there still are a lot of unknowns about the assay. Well, we started this assay, or we developed it because we focus on the Western blot, which is a great assay, it's over 40 years old, 
Unfortunately, it had some down points, specifically well, the Intel Western assay, you can now screen through 96 or even 384 samples on one plate. Also, there's a lot, there's less steps. So there's no longer harvesting the proteins, you know, excising that lysate. Um, you don't have to run the gel. You don't have to do the transfer. Eliminating these steps leads to a higher consistency for the data. There's going to be more reproducibility, especially between replicates. Comparing it to flow cytometry, we are really looking at our target in situ. So our protein is going to be either inside or outside of this cell, but it's in its native home. It's also going to be in its native structure. Um, the acquisition of the image is straightforward. There is no instrument maintenance. So no need to set up the instrument, declog it, or even clean it after the fact. And then lastly, the quantification is very straightforward. You have a key that gets placed on the plate, and then you get your signal values for all the wells. So there's no gating necessary. There's no choosing your uh, grouping of cells that's going to be applicable. Now, compared to microscopy, this is also a much higher throughput assay. I worked with plenty of groups that are spending hours on a microscope, which requires intense training just to find a field of view of cells that looks good. So the time that it takes is usually immense. Um, and then also the analysis might not always be very straightforward. Um, it can be difficult looking at your field of view, hoping that it represents the cells versus maybe a few hundred to a few thousand on a microscope. And lastly, uh, comparing it to an ELISA, and ELISAs typically have an output of a um, color metric or chemiluminescence signal. That does limit you. You only can look at one target. With the InSol Western assay, you can look at two or even three targets in each one of your samples. And that signal that we are detecting, that fluorescent signal, is going to be very stable. It doesn't change based on any environmental conditions because we're working with the dye. And all of that together really um, works nicely with the dynamic range capabilities. So with the assay itself, you're going to be producing or hopefully collecting a lot of variation in the light output, a low abundance signal, a high abundance signal. We want to capture that in one image. And that is going to be um, absolutely capable on in, with the InSol Western assay. Now, I'm not going to go into too many details about the examples for the InSol Western assay because um, I'll allow Joe and Virginia to do that. But I think it's important to really talk about what I've been discussing with a lot of virologists lately. And that is assay up for them, or even looking at viral research such as mechanism of action or quantifying viral titers. There are a lot of applications to this um, because you can look at multiple targets, the ability to quantify, to normalize, that has become so popular. And we have just seen the increase in popularity over the years. Um, so before I hand that off, I just want to let everybody know that we have revamped the resources and the support that we have for our customers. So if this is something you want to work on, please note that we're here for you, whether that's through um, a handbook that we have to offer or even just a scientist that you want to talk to. Uh, so thank you for that. And I can um, end there. Thank you, Jessica. Um, our, our next panelist who's going to give a brief talk is Virginia. Virginia, please take it away. Okay, I'm hoping you can see my screen now. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, so thank you very much for the nice introduction. So quite a few of the things I'm going to say you've already mentioned. But basically, what I wanted to say is that I had a problem uh, and that I've tried to, to solve with this technology. I work uh, in rare diseases, mostly neuromuscular diseases, and I mostly use cell culture models to either identify differences between patients and uh, and controls or to test new drugs. So my main problem is that those samples coming from rare patients are rare by default. 
And in many cases, their muscle biopsies from children, they often haven't been uh, cultured, so they're quite scarce. And you need to take as much information as possible from that uh, small piece of, uh, of sample. And those are cultures that are primary cultures. They don't grow very well. So you have very little protein. Uh, and also, uh, it's, very, it's very likely that you're going to be interested in a protein that is only being expressed whenever your myoblasts have differentiated into myoblasts, into myotubes. So you do need to, to grow them for quite a lot of time to get to see a very small amount of protein. The other thing that we started working with it was dystrophin. Dystrophin is a protein that is huge. You can see here how big it is. So standard Western blots are complicated. And when I started working on this, everybody seemed to have their own small re little recipe. Now it has improved. But basically, this is the kind of bands they would get. You would use tons of sample, and you would get a really nasty band. And to be able to quantify anything like that, you would also need to use tons of lanes to make a standard curve and be able to quantify this properly. So that is wasting a lot of sample that is not something that you, you that you're likely to be able to do because you'd only have a small amount of sample from patients. So it was difficult to reproduce, quite laborious. It took us around three days to run Western. We had to grow it, uh, run it over several hours, then transfer it overnight, then use a primary overnight again. Quite laborious. Uh, in contrast to that. Uh, we uh, the the insel western allow us to use smaller plates, fewer cells to get more replicable results. So basically, what we had to do with western blood was to use pretty much a whole whale of cells, cram it into one single lane of that, and then get a very nasty looking uh, 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 band. Whereas we could use several wells on a six wall plate using fewer cells and then get uh, many more replicates. So in our case, as Jessica had, uh, had described before, what we did was to seed the cells, grow them, differentiate them, because we're interested in something that is only expressed here. If not, probably you could go at this stage. Then you fix, permeabilize, use your antibodies, and scan it. So that allows us to use fewer cells, less steps, and is more reproducible. So we compare that with our standard Western blots at some point in this publication. And those were different amount of cells and how we could see the different, uh, the different, uh, different expression of dystrophin. Uh, and the good thing is that you can normalize by the cell number. Uh, if you compare that with a Western blot, this is the amount of, of cells, basically the equivalent to a well that you had to load in the, in the Western blot to see anything. And this is the equivalent quantification. Basically, this thing here in the, I think probably, maybe I'll just put it in the laser. This here is this here. So by using fewer cells, we're getting a much more accurate result. So this is pretty much how we do it and how we get pretty reproducible results. You see that we can get quite a lot of different uh, dots in our quantifications and, and that give us robust results over and over. So we're quite happy. We've done it for dystrophin and we're doing it now for other proteins in, in other neuromuscular disorders. And we're quite happy with what we see when we are using this to compare patients against control or different treatments. So this is, a, for example, a drug screening. So we are quite happy with the replication. Uh, this is an idea of how we may set up a plate when we're doing things like that. I have to say that I do recommend leaving the end, the the outside of the of the plate empty because we've we've realized that that makes quite a bit of a difference which means that you're not going to be able to use all the full 96 word plate and you're also going to need to leave some blanks for anti uh, no primary controls or different uh, different controls but it still will give you many more repeats that are standard western blood so for us it's a very good alternative we use less cells we have more replicates it has good discriminations and we're using it to either check for different treatments to quantify marker proteins in wild type versus disease models. And we also to characterize new cell culture models that we've been creating in the lab. Advice when you're doing something like this, you need to know your culture. You need to know how quickly it grows, if you need to grow it for longer or, or not. 
you have to be aware of funky cell culture plates because we had problems with that before. Uh, so I do recommend you test empty plates because sometimes you may be surprised. Uh, you need to validate your antibodies. This technique is only going to be as good as your antibodies. So I think it's a good rule of thumb is that if it's, work, it's working fine in the microscope, in the standard uh, in, uh, immunocytochemistry assay, it will probably work quite well, but you will still need to optimize it a bit. And you also need a quality control. For us, for example, if we see that our cells are not differentiating quite well enough, we probably may not consider the results. So this is us, if you have any questions. And those are a couple of uh, publications in which we've used it. This particular one, and I think you're going to have access to the PDF of this presentation later on, is open access and it's pretty much a step-by-step -step, uh, method on how we do it for dystrophin, but you probably can easily apply it for other proteins. So this is me, uh, so I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, yeah. I don't hear you, Jackie. And Jackie, on mute, on mute. Sorry about that. Yeah, I have just so many buttons to <laughs> click here, so I'll get through. Thank you to all our presenters for their introductions. Um, I am going to um, start sharing my screen that contain um, the questions, uh, the prepared yeah, questions that we I'm had. I'm going to go, right? Jackie, I'm going to go. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Joseph, <Yeah. laughs> last but not <laughs> least, Joseph, um, please <laughs> take it away. So I'm a, I'm a medicinal chemist. Let me see, turn my, let me turn my uh, camera on here. Okay, so I'm a medicinal chemist and, and um, our work is, um, we're, we're, we're using this technology for, to monitor for potential protax. These, these are uh, these bifunctional compounds that um, um, perform this targeted protein degradation. Um, so let me just move this forward. Okay. So I have just a, a, a number of bullet points here and, and to really to raise some of the issues. And then I have a slide of, of some data. But we're using this really as a high throughput method to look at uh, target protein levels after treatment of, of, of potential protax, really to see if we can identify compounds that will degrade our protein of interest. Um, and this is really essential for when we're trying to develop structure activity relationships in an er early in a program, really to identify, you know, first compounds for protax. And, and we really need to look at 20 or 30 compounds or so pretty rapidly. So our chemistry group can easily generate uh, 20 to 25 compounds in about a week or so that, and then we need feedback in order to improve these compounds. So you can just imagine if you have to run 20 or 30 Western blots in, you know, eight point different, eight, eight concentrations to try to develop some, you know, uh, uh, dose response curves for these, for these compounds, because the, 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 the protax are really sensitive where you're going to look for, where you're going to see the uh, uh, targeted, the protein degradation. So it's really difficult in a, in a Western blot assay. So what we want to do is use this in-cell Western to really increase, increase the speed. So this assay, again, it's a plate-based assay, a quantitative immunofluorescent method. And then we use it to monitor the uh, uh, protein levels after protac treatment. And it really complements the Western blotting. We don't replace Western blotting, we complement it because we always go back and confirm the activity of the compounds in, uh, that we see from activity from the in-cell Western. So we use the in-cell Western in our lab, we use the in-cell Western as a very quick way to screen compounds. Now there are other methods to screen compounds like uh, for example, you know, a high bed assay or some other, other uh, uh, engineered cell line, for example, but they're really, they take a long time to develop. You can get into this, into this assay and, and develop the assay really rapidly within a week or so you can, um, you know, do your linearity make sure that the antibodies work 
and have an assay ready to use and start testing compounds within a week or so. Um, so the assay uses, in our hands, we find that adherent cells seem to work best because there's a number of wash steps and uh, we found our most, uh, our, our most uh, uh, robust data came from the use of adherent cells. But um, we're able to very rapidly go into cell, cell lines of high interest. Um, so for example, in, in one of the ex examples I show, we were looking at leukemia. Now, the, the cell, many of the cells were suspension cells where we were able to then use a surrogate adherent cell to evaluate the compounds very rapidly. And then we go back in and, and, and confirm in our cell line of interest, okay? So cells are treated with the, the degraders, they're fixed and permalized and microplate for, for uh, immunostaining. The te technique is robust and sensitive. It's using these sec secondary an antibodies that are conjugated to these very bright IR dyes. Um, we monitor levels after compound treatment and, the, and the, importantly, the cells are normalized to cell number using the cell or DNA stain. So this is really important because in a um, uh, medicinal chemistry campaign, what we're doing is not only do we uh, have a, a, a nice way to normalize our data based on cell number, but we get a first read on cell viability, the effects of cell viability with our compounds because we're monitoring cell numbers. So if we decrease cell numbers significantly, well, our, our, our compounds have are cytotoxic in that cell line, right? So it's a, a really rapid way to screen compounds, uh, get a secondary read on cell viability, and then we confirm everything back into a, in a Western blood assay. All right, so this is giving us a very accurate readout for protein expression and cell population in each cell. It's again, uh, less labor intensive, less time consuming than traditional Western blot. Like I said, if we have to do 20 compounds in, uh, to evaluate 20 compounds in a Western blot assay, that's gonna take a significant amount of time versus we can turn around this data in two to three days um, and then prioritize our best compounds for Western blotting. Uh, we monitor protein in our cellular context, which is also important. Um, that's also key when we're, we're choosing antibodies. Um, it's rapid and it's precise um, after our cellular treatments. And uh, so um, again, uh, use of adherent cell lines is, is in our hands was critical. Um, uh, good antibody is, is very important. So that's, that's probably one of the, the, you know, an advantage and a disadvantage. If you've got a, a great antibody, then you're, then you're off and running. If you're if you don't have a good antibody, then you're then you're this technique is kind of limited a little bit. But um, let's see here. And the, the adherent cells work best because of the number of wash steps. Rapid. Uh, it's a rapid means to screen and prioritize the screen and prioritize our compounds for Western blotting, and then we normalize. Gives us a fir first readout on cell viability. Okay. So let me just show you some some of the uh, data that we can generate. So for example, here. This is a, um, an example that we used in our CDK6 uh, degrader program. And um, we normally would, were, were focused on uh, targeting leukemia, but the cell lines there were, um, were all suspension cells. So we shifted over and we found that we could monitor in, these, in this melanoma cell line, adherent cell line, and when we can ge generate a, 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 a linearity to make sure that the um, the, we get a nice linear signal for the antibody and uh, at various different uh, and make sure that we look at different cell number to, and then we want to make sure we run the assay in that uh, in those under those attributes, those specific attributes. And um, if, if one of the downsides is if the compound is cytotoxic and we start to decrease our cell number drastically, then we do have the data is a little confounded and it's, and it's difficult to read. But if you if your compounds are not very cytotoxic under under your assay conditions, then you can very rapidly screen. Okay, so this is just uh, this top row here is just uh, some data on the on, on on cell linearity, and then here on the bottom, what I'm showing you is that we can rapidly look at uh, what do I have about eight compounds here. We can look at eight eight to 10 different doses. Um, uh, we use a 96 well plate format. 
Um, and here, very quickly, and what, what I'm showing you here is actually looking at these potential degraders at two different concentrations. We Here we start at um, uh, a 30 micromolar into a three-fold dilution. And here in this panel, we're starting at one micromolar because we found compounds are quite potent. And we started one micromolar into our three-fold dilution. So we can end up getting a, a very, very uh, accurate uh, analysis of, of the degrader and um, uh, many points in our dose response curve to really get a very accurate and robust dose response curve. And in addition, what I'm showing you over here is just the ability to look at the, the, the effect on cell number. And we can see here that most of the compounds don't negatively affect the cell number under the conditions. And we're usually looking at things like uh, maybe maybe a six hour treatment or a 24 hour treatment. Here's a 24 hour treatment. And we don't have, uh, only one compound was really showing a, 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 a strong cytotoxic effect under these conditions. And, and it, now if all the, so this is really important information. We know that this particular compound is either more potent in killing this melanoma cell line, or it's, it's gonna be uh, um, just generally cytotoxic. Right. So uh, we get a lot of information in terms of a dose response, dose, dose response of degradation, as well as effect on cytotoxicity. Let's see here. Okay. And then this is just a couple of references. So um, we published uh, with Lily Lou, we published the effect of the, uh, the Incel Western in this uh, methods paper. Um, and there's a lot of detail in there on actually how to run the assay. And then this paper is uh, our blood paper on the uh, CDK6 Protax showing basically a lot of Western blots, but also, you know, the basis of uh, what we're doing with these compounds and how they work. That's, that's it, right? So thank you. Okay. Stop sharing. Many thanks to our expert speakers for their presentations. Um, a quick reminder to those watching us live that you can still submit your questions by clicking the Ask a Question tab on the right, typing the question into the message box, and then clicking Submit. We will now dive into some pre-developed questions and interweave these with questions that come from you, viewers. Um, let me just share my screen once again. Uh, let's see pop up momentarily. Here we are. No, it's going through all of the slides here. Bear with me here. I thought I had it at the next slide. Ah, here we are. Oops. Oh, geez. Sorry about that. Hold on. Chris was stuck here. Okay. All right. So the first question is, and I know that it was mentioned in um, the some of the introductory presentations, but it's good for a repeat. Um, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of using in-cell Western assays? Um, we'll start with you, Jessica. Sure. So the advantages are going to be that higher throughput methodology. If you need to screen through a lot of targets, drugs, concentrations, you can get data really quick once you have the assay optimized. So that kind of leads to the disadvantage is that optimization or getting up and running. I've worked with groups that have never um, worked with their cell line in a 96 low format or their target or their antibody. And those groups need a little bit more hand-holding on my part, um, more of a discussion where we talk through the assay in completeness to see how it's applicable to their research and how to optimize it. But other groups where they're like, oh, we do immunocytochemistry all the time, just maybe in a different style or we look at different things, those groups can get up and running in no time, kind of like uh, Joe said, in a week. So the uh, pros are going to be the, um, the ability to look at the, look at a lot of samples in a very short period of time, but the cons could be that it's not an off-the-shelf kit. You have you may have to do some development on your part. 
Okay. Um, Joseph, do you want to take it? Uh, yeah, I think for the 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 ability to get up and running quickly is is really important, right? I mean, because the um, um, so there there are some there there you know we we use the Incel Western really as a screening assay. So because we can go into different cell lines, we can quickly do a linearity uh, evaluation. So basically, just look to see how well the antibody works in those different cell lines, and do we have um, you know a, a, a linear response? And make sure that we we evaluate the you know the 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 signal at that in that linear range, and then we're going to have very robust data, and, um, and that's all done by our experts in the you know to be honest, I'm the I'm the chemist not doing all the work. Lily and 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 the other people in our, our group are doing the Incel Western and really doing all the detailed uh, processing of this. But it's very quick to evaluate, very quick to uh, get an assay running, and then we can then generate a dose response curve so you can look at multiple concentrations very quickly. So if we try to do that with a Western blot, for example, we might be able to you know, get three or four different concentrations on there if we want to look at maybe four or five compounds at a time on a, on a, a pretty large gel. Um, but here in the Incel Western, we can look at eight to 10 different concentrations very rapidly uh, and, and very easily evaluate 20 or 30 compounds and get data back in a couple of days. Great. Um, Virginia, do you have anything additional to add? <laughs> Not much more. I think it's mostly the, the ability to use fewer cells. For us, using very, you know, delicate cells, uh, being able to, to use fewer cells is, is an advantage for us. And then you can do many more, much, many more experiments because you can do more doses or more different compounds or lots of things in the same plate. Okay. All right. Well, we're already starting to get a lot of questions. Uh, my box is uh, flooding here. Um, so we'll start with uh, let's see, the first one. In cell Western blot, does it only work with cells or can I use the technique with tissue lysate? I'm just going to open it up to the group here. Well, you could. It's just that it's a bit of a pity because then you lose, you, you, you end up lysating your cells and then you may lose some of the, of the things. You may also the good thing about the insult of Western is that it's your uh, native protein as it is in the right localization and so on. But uh, yes, you, you can also use it. It's just a different approach. It, uh, I don't think it will be an insult Western anymore. It will be more like a play to say, but you can try to use it for that. True. Um, let's see. Um, here's another question. What advantage does Incel Western offer as compared to high content imaging that is also high throughput? So I, I'm going to quickly answer that one because that is a very common question that I get. With high content, you typically get a lot of information. The whole high content term just means to expect a lot. And most of my customers I'm working with just don't need that information. So for them, it's unnecessary to be using either advanced instrumentation or getting a large data set worth of info and then trying to parse through it. They really just need to get a total wellular worth of signal and then make a decision based on that rather instead of like nitty gritty fine details that we typically get from high content imaging. I was going to say something else. It's much cheaper. <laughs> Come on. I mean, I cannot afford a high content equipment such as those that have a great microscope underneath and they can give you tons of data. I mean, I would love to get that much data. I'm a scientist, you know, the more data, the better. But on the other side, I probably don't need all that. Uh, and for me, it, it does the job that I need and it does it quickly and it's much, much cheaper and I, I could afford it. Okay. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll secondary that, that the, 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 the Incel Western, it, it, you know, it's going to, it's an assay that's really going to complement your other techniques, right? So it's, uh, you, you, we're not saying, you know, it's going to replace the high content screening, but it's something you can rapidly get up and running. It is rather inexpensive. Um, and, you, you know, the, you can, you can kind of pinpoint the data that you're really looking for. 
Well, in, you know, in our case, looking for, you know, pro, the protein degradation, we can really quickly uh, evaluate this in, with an, you know, a number of different concentrations and get a robust answer very quickly. So that's, that's a, a big advantage. Okay. Um, another viewer is wondering, can you multiplex your analysis? I can comment on that. The advantage of this system is that depending on the instrument you have, you can look at two or potentially three different targets um, in the two or three different channels. So multiplexing is one of the biggest advantages if you're looking to normalize, for example, or if you just have multiple targets. So absolutely in the acquisition of the image, you can, you're going to get the different channels and then the quantification, it will separate out the signal from both of them. And you can have your target signal normalized to to whatever internal loading control that you have. And also you can normalize it within the same well, proper multiplexing, but also as you have many other wells, you can also use something as a quality control. In our case, for example, we do use the cell stain, the cell tag as a multiplexing normalizer, but we also have another antibody next to, because we have multiplex, uh, multi, multiple wells, we can always also have another antibody testing for something that we consider to be a quality control of the growth or the differentiation of our of our cells. And that also gives you another, uh, something else that you probably wouldn't be able to do in a Western blood because you would need to have another lane or, or, or run another sample next to it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's true. We always, we always use a, a, a control compound as a, you know, to make sure that we can then evaluate uh, the effect of, of the other of new new compounds being tested in the presence of the control compound, which which if you do that in a Western blot, you're you're using up a, a valuable lane and losing the ability to, to, to evaluate another compound. OK, um, I'm going to go back to uh, one of our panel questions. Um, uh, what questions can you answer with the in cell Western assays? Virginia, I'll throw it to you first. For us, it's mostly comparing patients versus versus disease cell cultures in most cases, and then response to, to treatment. Those are the main things. But I think that you can do many other things. So for example, in our lab, we've also used it to, to get some titration for, for virus that we're using for something else, just to check you know, how, how well or how badly they were doing. It was much quicker than to do some other analysis. So I think it just depends on, on how you may want to use it. You you have a, a tool that is going to give you a response, and then it depends on on your imagination at some, at some point. Hey, Joseph, um, do you want oh, to? Yeah, so in, in, um, in our lab, it's uh, essentially anything that seemed to work in a Western blot, you know, in terms of, um, you know, it, it, isolating cell lysate and then using Western blood assay. So for example, signaling, we can look at uh, ERK plus correlation or effect on, you know, uh, TNF levels or IL-1 beta levels. So we can use it for some different signaling molecules that we would normally use a Western blot for. And, uh, but it's also, again, a little bit more high throughput, and then we can evaluate more compounds. So, uh, you know, we have been focused more on this, the, using it for uh, targeted protein degradation, but we also have used it for just monitoring different protein levels uh, uh, in, in, cellular, in the, its cellular content, context. Okay. Um, do you have any, any thoughts on yeah. this? Um, well, if you, if you have a chance, then you can go back and look at the slides, which will be provided for you. I do have a wide variety of examples that kind of answer this question. Um, I've had groups that are looking at signaling pathways, so they want to um, quantify what is the impact of their drug in respect to phosphorylation of a protein. Um, I've had groups that are doing screening libraries. Maybe that means like a chemical, kind of similar to what Joe's doing, or if you're producing monoclonal antibodies. Um, just anything, I think to reiterate, anything that you can test for on a Western blot, you can test for for the in-cell Western, because the all you're doing is probing for your target inside of a cell. So the, the general idea of what's happening is going to be the same as what we're looking for in a Western blot. Although you have to keep in mind that your protein is not going to be uh, 
denuclearized. So sometimes there might be some antibodies that may not like it as well uh, as the Western blood or not. So you may need to and, test it. Which is a very, very important point. Um, in that discussion I have, I always make sure we talk about the little tiny things that can get in the way and your primary antibody, which both of you very nicely pointed out, is going to dictate the quality of your assay. This actually ties in nicely with the viewer question we got here. Um, to limit nonspecific binding, do you use a monoclonal primary and polyclonal secondary in that order? We like to use monoclonals because of the, you know, the, the selectivity. If there's a, if there's a lot of uh, off-target bands, it tends to dilute the signal, and um, we find that the 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 assays doesn't work as well. So the quality of the antibody is is key, and and you know, getting a specific signal is also key. I mean, so that that brings up one of the things that might be really interesting is to um, somehow link. Uh, Lycor could link the um, uh, antibody providers, and and actually then just you know test test various antibodies in in the system, to you know just provide you know maybe a you know a linearity signal or 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 something so that we would we when we go looking at different antibodies for use in the system we'd be able to quickly know that they work in the Lycor system or not, you know because that's a limitation. And, and just as a note on that, we do have a. Um, a resource on our website where if you are in interested in this assay, you would put in the information regarding your target, your cell line, and um, we could provide to you all the antibodies that have been published for that particular assay. So in this case, it'd be the InCell Western assay. So while it's not something we have tested in-house, we do have a summation of what's been published so far. So it's worked in other systems. Yeah, I have to say we, I, I work in, in muscle and most muscle antibodies are really bad in general and that is a bit of a problem so we tend to use monoclonal antibodies where possible but we also are quite aware that in some cases they're slightly dirty so we also do keep some wells without the primary antibody just a secondary to double check that we are we can deduct that from the signal so it's good to have some controls in there and with any assay, the quality of your experiment is also dictated based on the controls. So it's important that you really are doing your due diligence and setting up this experiment and making sure that your controls are truly applicable to what you're studying. Yeah, I mean, it was many times what, what we use the InCell Western to complement our other assays. So, I mean, uh, as a general rule of thumb, we try to have three or four different complementary assays to really confirm what's going on. And I think that's, you know, that's that's key and it's very important for, you know, mm -hmm. being able to make sure that you're you're really seeing the right thing and you're not being led down the wrong path with your, with your treatment. Yeah, I see that is someone asking about the review process in manuscripts and that has been a problem. Uh -huh. uh, reviewers don't like Insel Western, I have to say that, but they're starting to like mm -hmm. it better. Uh, you tend to have to convince them with the Western blood because they love Western bloods. Uh, and it's true that you do need to show them that your antibody is going to be uh, the right antibody, that you have the band, and then, uh, and then show it later on. But if it's an, an antibody that is commonly used, it's not that necessary, but they tend to like that. Uh, but also, Hey, now we've been publishing this site, Joseph or, or myself, and, and get those reviewers know that it's already been done. So it's definitely becoming more legit. <laughs> um, so another viewer is asking, can you perform um, this assay using suspension cells? You can, but I think uh, Joseph has kind of talked about the limitation to it. So okay. while it's possible, you need to be more mindful. So as suspension cells aren't going to be adhering or binding to the plate, there is a potential for cell loss. If this is the avenue you wanna go down, we do have recommendations, we do have a protocol for it, and I could help talk you through it, such as doing like a cyto spin after certain steps where we see protein loss. And I mean, just putting it in a centrifuge and spinning it down. So there are workarounds we have been successful with it. You just have to be more careful. And from my experience, it seems that the groups that as they do more and more of these, they, they develop a better technique and they lose less cells as they continue. But to counter that, that's why we encourage the normalization to a cell tag. 
or to, to our stain, the cell tag or any type of cellular stain, because if there is cell loss, you have that, that um, the normalization or the, the adding the cell tag to kind of let you know. So it helps if there is cell loss from well to well. So sorry, long answer to your short question. Yes, you can do suspension cells. We would just have recommendations to make it um, more applicable or easier for you in the lab. Okay, I guess uh, people are wondering about normalization. So uh, what is the limiting factor to just analyzing three proteins for every in-cell Western assay? Is it possible to analyze more proteins at the same time? I think it will be mostly uh, on the Odyssey, standard Odyssey, it will be one protein plus the normalization agent in my case. If you have the next one, the M, which has another channel, you probably can do two plus another normalizing uh, reagent. Uh, and I think that should probably be the upper limit on the on the ones that you can use. But also you can use usually have the edges and lane or, or, or row to do other proteins. So in our case, we tend to do different proteins being analyzed in the same plate with just, you know, changing the antibodies that we're doing in different lanes or in different rows. Okay. Oh, this is a question that takes me back. Why is it that the wells on the edge of the plate shouldn't be used? Does that create a bias? No, well, it's, it, I think it also depends on the cultures you're using. I think uh, Joseph is using something that it goes really quickly, but in our case, we need to differentiate our cultures for up to a week to 10 days in the incubator, and that sometimes creates some evaporation in the, in the end. So for us, it's a problem. And we've, after, you know, lots of trial and error, we decided to go this way because we were, we were not trusting our results so much when they were belonging to cells at the, at the um, corners of the, of the plate. So we decided to get rid of that. Okay. Yeah, we see, we see this edge effect also. And, and um, so we, we tend to, I think, um, we prefer to use these 96 well, half well plates to save on reagents. And, um, but I, um, we also tend to um, leave the edges empty uh, to avoid that evaporation. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a very common practice: just filling the outer edges with TBS or any type of buffer to ensure that um, if there is airflow going in, it's not going to dry out your cells immediately. Some groups have um, found ways to work around it, and you know we even have examples of a successful 96 and 384 well format. But it all depends on what your needs are. Um, it may just be easier instead of having to develop it and try to make it work just to skip those outer edges. Okay. Um, someone is asking, can we use labeled antibodies instead of the two-step approach, primary then secondary? You can just keep in mind that the advantage of the secondary antibodies for the amplification of the signal, when you directly label your primary antibody, you're going to have um, you know, less of a signal that's coming out of it. Now, if you're looking at a strong, uh, abundant protein, it's not that big of a deal, and it does save you some steps, especially if you're talking about suspension cells. But if you're looking at really getting to the limit of sensitivity or detection, it would be worthwhile to use that extra step and have the secondary antibody. Someone's asking, regarding performing a trial run with an empty plate, what should users look for in evaluating whether the plate can be used for in-cell Western on the LICOR? We, we did have that experience in which we saw that uh, there were differences between the outer lanes and the inner lanes, depending on the make of the plates. Uh, so sometimes different vendors may have different qualities. So I think it's, it's a Good idea to test the, the plates that you're using generally for cell culture. Maybe they're already the good ones, but if not, I would recommend you test them before. Just on an empty plate on the Odyssey and, and check what you get. And sometimes you get like a smile on the signal, and that's not good because <laughs> <laughs> you're not going mean, to like it. We clearly saw the same thing, right? So it's yeah. like when the, I think when uh, during COVID, the quality of the plastic plastics were you know, <laughs> you know changing right so uh, we had we had issues not being able to get uh, the same high quality plates that we were using so it, it is really important and so i would you know we, we try to identify plates that work best in the assay and then we just buy you know boxes and boxes of them so we don't you know yeah. we have the same plate to use over and over again yeah we've had problems also with being able to buy those 
good place to mm -hmm. uh, I think COVID has been a problem for plastic wear everywhere. And sometimes manufacturer will even indicate on the plate if it's designed for optical optical imaging. So it is important that even from the beginning when you're going to look at the different options that you are selecting one that is geared towards imaging rather than just maybe cell growth. But, but don't trust them. Test them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, is this assay good for screening antibodies from different vendors and differing in specificity to target? So I actually have example where my uh, col colleague, she spent a lot of time really revamping the resources that we had, and she used this assay alone to screen through the different antibodies. So if you set up your controls appropriately and that you have a negative control that doesn't express your target and a positive control that does, simply seeing that, that change difference between those controls would be enough for you to screen through and determine which is going to be ideal. So the example that I have just shows at multiple concentrations how much better one antibody was because the positive signal was so much greater than the negative in comparison to the second one she was doing. But again, I can't stress enough how important that the controls are for when you're developing this. Your assay is only going to be as good as you differentiate your positive and negative controls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've done it also. All right. Um, I'm going to do maybe one more question. All right. Uh, pros and cons between 4% paraformaldehyde and methanol fixing? We tend to use more methanol in general, but that also sometimes depends on the antibody. Uh, for the incel, methanol works also. It's, uh, it seems to work a bit better in our hands, uh, but cold methanol. Uh, for on-cell, which we've also been running, uh, we tend to use more PFA. You also need to think that you may need to permeabilize your cells if you are interested in something that is inside the cells and not permeabilize them if whatever you're interested in is not inside the cells. Yeah, so methanol is going to be more uh, stringent and it, it pokes bigger holes into the cells, so yeah. more things get into it. Um, paraformaldehyde is more commonly used, and I think it's just for historical purposes why you'll see it in more protocols. But part of the development conversation I have is to really contest those two out and compare them. Methanol will also allow you to get into your nuclear targets a little bit better because it is just more thorough in its permeabilization capabilities. But we've also seen methanol just being so good that there was um, maybe drastic variability between replicates within a particular sample. So it is more dependent on your cell and your antibody. We don't ever, I don't want you to ever think that there's a one shot that's gonna work for every situation. Great. That's great. Yeah, I think we use primarily uh, paraformaldehyde, but uh, I think we should try the other method. Okay. Um, so here, I guess we have one last question, uh, panel question um, here. Uh, what types of improvements or advancements will in-cell Western assays have in the future? Well, I, I'm going to just quickly throw out there that, um, you know, adding that extra channel with our new instrument has really expanded the capabilities. Um, you know, we are looking and excited about that avenue. And then I've also been working with groups that are moving to a more hired order environment. So instead of a monolayer of cells, they're thinking or uh, working towards something more tissue like or 3D. That is where, at LightCore, we're really getting excited about how we can utilize now the extra capabilities of our instrument and um, move into like a tissue-like environment. So while it would not be a formal in-cell Western assay, it could be almost be a derivative of that, and that would help move as we see the environment, we're moving away from trying to get in vivo and do stuff more in vitro, but still have a connection to the in vivo world which a tissue-like environment would be more applicable towards. Virginia, Joseph, any uh, thoughts about we, like, what would you like to see? Just I saying, um, I think the third channel, we're very excited about it. We only just got the, the M version and we are playing around. The main problem with that is being able to get enough uh, uh, antibodies for your target that are not coming from mm -hmm. the same host because then you wouldn't be able to use that extra capability. And in some cases, it's not possible. But if for some of the proteins in which you have 
you know, a wide variety of, of, of antibodies is probably very applicable. Uh, so I think that's something quite exciting. And also, we've also tried to use it on on matrices just to check 3D um, um, culture of, of cells. And it doesn't work as well, but it may depend on the matrix. So that's something that we would also, if we had more hands, more time, more everything, we would be very happy to, to explore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I, we're, we're excited about the, you know, the, the, we only have the two channels right now. So we, we, you know, so we have one for our protein of interest and one for our normalization stain. And then, uh, you know, so getting, getting an instrument that can look at, uh, you know, an additional one or two channels is, is going to be really uh, pretty interesting. We're, we're uh, I think that it'll be really cool. And then, um, you know, it's like uh, the, 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 hot, the most challenging part for us really has been to just the search for antibodies. Many times we just look for antibodies that seem to work um, for, you know, IF and then and we can get, uh, you know, pretty decent antibodies. But uh, some proteins, it's a real challenge. And, uh, you know, so linking that up with, um, you know, uh, where, where the antibodies have been tested, would really help researchers. I think it would save a lot, save us a lot of time. Um, I'm aware that we, uh, some of us here have a hard stop at once. So I'm going to try to wrap things up, but there are, it's like a fire hose of questions. So, and thank you viewers. And we will do our best to answer them after the um, live event. So um, it just leaves me to say our farewell here. Let me pull up our slides once again. Okay. Can you see my slides in the deck? Okay. So, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for right now. It just remains for me to thank today's speakers, um, Dr. Virginia um, Arakova Gomez, um, Dr. Joseph Salvino, and Dr. Jessica Zinsky. Um, so please go to the URL now at the bottom of your slide viewer to learn more about resources related to today's discussion and look out for more webinars from science available at webinar.sciencemag.org. This webinar will be made available to view again as an on-demand presentation within approximately 48 hours from now. We're interested to know your thoughts of this webinar. Send us an email to the address now up in your slide viewer, webinar at AAAS.org. Again, thank you to our speakers and to LICOR Biosciences for their kind sponsorship of today's educational seminar. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.